Danny, it is a great honor and a great privilege today, and I hand the meeting over to you. Okay. How many of you believe in miracles? Good. Because this miracle happened a few months ago at the Monash ICU in Clayton, Victoria. I happened to get a series of telephone calls from the ICU because people were dying and they were on life support and given up hope by the doctors in the medical profession. And they called me up and I go and pray and people started getting healed in the Monash ICU. I'll tell you when to put that photograph up. So just hold on for the moment. So a series of healings led to this particular one. I got a call and they said there's this 14 year old girl called Maddie who's on life support and given not much of hope. Let's put that first photograph up, please. Can you see that photo clear? Yeah. Do you need the light switched off a bit or you're okay? You can see it. Can? Yes. Great, okay. Now, Maddie was basically complained of a headache. The parents took her to the GP. The GP checked out and said it's a migraine. Give her some Panadols. Went back home. Continued, the headache continued. Two days later, the mother took her back to the GP. He said, keep her in a dark room. They tried that, but then the mother basically realized something was more than just a headache. Took her to the hospital, to emergency, where they did a uh, C CT scan. And they found out that there was a tumor growing right next to her brain. And the, it was pressing against the brain, and that was what which was causing the headaches. So they basically, in emergency operation, but the tumor erupt, what do you call it, it's, uh, yeah, ruptured or erupted, and the matter went into the brain cells, thus causing paralysis, pa pa uh, paralyzing a part of her body. So the doctors basically said, when I walked into that hospital room, she was in that state, she's 14, her daughter sister who is 12, and the older sister who is 16, and the mother and the father were in tears. The doctors had told them that she will possibly never ever recover even if she recovers, she will be on a bed, she will not talk, she will not walk, she will not recognize them. So I am a strong believer that God has given us doctors, but when the doctors can't anymore, Dr. Jesus can. Amen. Because in my lifetime, I've had the opportunity of raising three people from the dead. And the third person who was raised from the dead is a woman from Wagga Wagga. Her testimony actually was published in the Age newspaper. That was a bigger miracle. You know what I mean? <laughs> the reason for that is the doctor who pronounced her dead was a very well-known doctor in Australia. So he actually gave evidence that he was on site and he tried to resuscitate her, but he could not. And he pronounced her dead and how this pastor called Daniel stepped in and prayed in Jesus' name, and she came back to life. So anyway, Monash, I see you. I walk in, I look at this girl, my heart is moved, and I say, don't worry, Jesus can heal her. When the doctors can, Jesus, when the doctors can't, Jesus can. I said, I want you to believe, not the negative report, but the positive report. Jesus said, by my stripes, you are healed. And so they got together, we went, took them through a time of praying and to cut a long story short, I prayed over the mother, daughter for healing and I left the hospital. Now I'd left the hospital and 24 hours later I got a text message from the mother and the first message said this, great news, Maddie has opened her eyes. 48 hours, Maddie starting to smile. 72 hours, with the help of two people, Maddie got off the bed. Five days later, I went to visit Maddie and I almost fell off the bed when I saw her. Let's look at this. Photo number two. The doctors told the parents, we have no answer. It's a miracle. 
Now, what's happened is in this last, in those last few months, I led approximately 90 people to Jesus in the Monash ICU. All because of people miraculously healed who was on life support. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So I'm at a function. I get a telephone call. And on the other side is a doctor from Monash ICU who I don't know. But he has heard of what's been happening in the hospital, in, his, in, in the intensive care unit. And he says to me, are you Pastor Daniel? I said, yes. He says, can you please come urgently? I'm about to remove life support on one, one of my patients. I was wondering whether you can pray for him. So a doctor who is not necessarily a church girl, hears about others getting healed and is calling me to come and pray because someone told him, you better get this pastor to come and pray because the person whose life support is removed, maybe that person might live. So that's the first time I parked free at the Monash Hospital. <laughs> Great. Okay, let's get to the topic that I was going to share. I'm just about to start the main course now. Okay. Now we look at a nation and very often, you know, we are troubled when we see what's happening. I'm personally very concerned about Australia's future because of things that I personally know. I lived in Saudi Arabia and I know how the Muslim mind ticks, how they're thinking, what they're thinking, and what they think of the West, and uh, what the West is thinking and what the West is doing. You know, there's a lot of apathy and a lot of complacency in our part of the world. We don't take things seriously. We wait till it comes into our backyard to wake up, by which time it's a bit too late. My court case was a classic example, and I thank God the victory gave us tremendous breakthrough. But for me, I believe that to take a nation, you have to act in the natural, but more so you have to act in the supernatural. Okay? Now, Muslims are people who very closely function in the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, as they function, I have no uh, uh, regrets for saying this. They are absolutely worshipping demons. Because if anyone is worshipping God in the real proper way, will never tell someone to go and kill another person. Okay, the Quran is full of verses to kill the infidels. I've read the Quran and that's why the media in Australia does not know what to do with me. When I say keep Australia Australian, they can't say anything because I'm a black fellow. <laughs> but you say keep Australia Australian, or you say something like what I say, I say normally I make this statement very frequently in media, I say, if you come to Australia, you made the choice to come here. We didn't ask you to come here. No one asked me to come here. I chose to come here. It's my duty now to leave my baggage behind and integrate into the new life I've come into. Now, if I think where I've come into is worse than where I've come from, then I need to shut up, pack my bags, and get back to where I came from. <laughs> so don't sit and whinge and say, my country was much better. If it was much better, why on earth are you here? Go back. And, but if you say that, immediately you're a racist. So SBS television, uh, SBS radio, when we first launched our Rise Up Power political party, called me and they wanted to interview me on World News. And they said this, Australia has a brand new political party called Rise Up Australia Party. The party slogan is keep Australia Australian. It's nothing but another white Australia Pauline Hanson party come again into the arena. Let me speak to the president himself and hear what he has to say. So, I spoke. I said, Mike, I think you have not done your maths properly. If you had done your homework, you would not be calling this a white Australia party because I'm a black fellow from Sri Lanka. I said, how could a black fellow lead a white Australia party? Sounds a bit silly. But I'll tell you what, in God's divine plan, he has given me a heart for my nation, Australia. To see beyond my color, to understand a nation's destiny. Tonight I'm going to speak about the destiny of Australia. 
and take you through a whole series of prophetic words starting from the Portuguese explorer's time. I have a DVD which today's message is on called Australia's Prophetic Destiny. The many altars we need to break down in order to see God's supernatural hand come on earth. Lord, let your will be on earth as it is in heaven. So it's been an interesting journey. And I realize more and more that the spiritual dimension is something most Aussies fully don't understand. Indigenous people understand them, but in a different way. Islam practices it in a different way, equipping the demonic powers. Now you might say, oh, we don't believe in demons. Well, that's your belief. I've dealt with them. I've cast them out. I've been reported on television news, the newspapers. You know the satanic cult of Victoria took a, tried to get a restraining order against me? You know? You know why? Because too many of their people are getting converted to Christianity. <laughs> it's very interesting. I finished my court case after five years because when I first came to Australia, I was feeling very bored. After living in Saudi Arabia, taking so much risk preaching Jesus, come to Australia and then it's like everything is life. <laughs> and I mean, when you kill a lion and a bear, you're really not looking for a chihuahua. <laughs> and so God decided to give me some excitement. He got the Muslims to sue me. So for five years, it was very exciting. But 2007, the court case, we won the case, and then I was telling my wife, I'm feeling very bored. And then the gay lobby wrote an email to me. They said that they're very offended, and they're taking me to court. So I responded and said, thank you very much. I was feeling so bored, I look forward to seeing you there. <laughs> Never heard back from them. <laughs> then I get a letter from the Frankston Magistrates Court. And it's an uh, action taken by the satanic cult. I don't know how many of you have heard of Anton Lavey. Yeah? Anton Lavey was the father of Satan worship. He started the first church of Satan in USA in 1960. He went around pregnant, what do you call it, making pregnant were in the cult to breed satanic, what do you call it, a, a ritualistic uh, test. Bloodline Satanists. So they were assigned to destroy me, my family, and my church. So they would send cult members constantly to our church. I will grab hold of them, get them born again, duck them in water, and they are set free. So the cult got really mad and decided to threaten me. So they threatened me, they threatened me, they threatened me. They, I would will, I will, I will not stop. So they took it to the magistrate's court. So I go to the courtroom. Now, I've been five years in a courtroom, so I thought I don't need a lawyer. I can talk for myself. Heard the lawyer speak and make a lot of money. The cult members were all seated on one side. Their barristers were there. I was seated on this side with a few other team members of my church. The magistrate comes, sits down, bows down, then sits, opens the file, and he says, this case is in between Catch the Fire Ministries and the Satanic Cult of Victoria. Then he goes, oh, Catch the Fire Ministries. He looks at the barrister of the cult and he says this, do you know who you are trying to sue? <laughs> I tell you what, I loved it. I didn't make, big, I didn't make a big noise, but I was like, And he says, this organization was sued by another organization. It was a media circus. For your information, he's telling the barrister of this satanic cult, these guys actually won the case. Now, what's the problem? Then he reads the document. He says, when I read this document, in your own words, you say that you have threatened him several times, but he will not stop talking to your people. According to what I read, he should be taking a restraining order against you. <laughs> He's the one who's been threatened. Then he says, I find no reason to 
Listen to this case, no issue a restraining order on this pastor. I think he's doing a good job. Case closed. No weapon formed against you can prosper. Every prayer I pray, it is a prayer of faith. Yeah? Praise God. So to take a nation, we need to have the spiritual and the natural. Let's look at the story of Gideon in the Bible, okay? Judges chapter 6. This is your homework. When you go home, read this chapter. Just to save time, I'll tell you quickly the story. Israel had come to a place where Israel decided, we have everything we need. Why do we need God? So they started forgetting God. They were full of themselves. They actually started worshipping foreign gods. And God's heart was really, really broken. At this point, what happens is the Midianites, according to the Bible, come and attack Israel and destroy their crops, carry away their cattle, and absolutely for six to seven or eight years, they gave them a hard time. Now, Israel was so improvised, according to the Bible, that Israel started crying out to God. You know, that's the problem we have in the West. We're so full of ourselves because God has blessed us so much, we have no time for God anymore. And soon, the West is falling into a big mess which people don't even realize. It's like we're almost blinded. Look at France. I said before, 754 no-go zones for a person who is white. Isn't that crazy? France opens its doors, lets immigrants come in. Now they take over the country and tell you don't come in my streets. Thank God we're in Australia. We are a bit too far from the action. However, if you don't wake up, it will be too late for us too. So, Gideon, the Israelites cry out to God, please help us. Please help us. We are in trouble. So God decides to raise up a simple, humble shepherd. So I think Gideon was something like a shepherd boy. He was the youngest in the family. As he describes himself, he calls himself the weakest in the clan of Manasseh, his people. Now, the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon when Gideon was crying, when the people are crying out, and the angel of the Lord tells Gideon, you mighty warrior. Now think of this. Say, uh, who can I, maybe Jeff, okay. Say Jeff is a young boy, which he is. He's the youngest in the family. And he's been just saying, Ah, oh, I'm the weakest in the clan of Manasseh. What can I do? And then I come and say, You mighty warrior! Either it's tongue and cheek, just being sarcastic, or I've seen something in Jeff that Jeff has not seen himself. God saw something in Gideon that Gideon did not even see. I want to tell you this this morning. I look in your eyes this morning and I say, God sees something in you that you don't even know. Inside every one of you is a mighty warrior. Yeah, let's give Jesus a clap offering. In my book, I've written an art, uh, uh, the story of when I met Jesus face to face for two hours and 20 minutes in Saudi Arabia on 21st July 1997 from 3.40 to 6 a.m. Jesus appeared in my house, not a dream, not a vision, and stood in front of me and he spoke to me. Now this evening I'll explain that further. But in that encounter, the task he gave me was so huge. In that t he told me in his audible voice that I was going to speak to the U.S. Congress. And you know what I told him? They will never receive me. You know why? Because I had low self-esteem. My skin color. You know what Jesus' answer was? I'm not after your ability. I'm only after your availability. 
Jesus looks at your availability. If you are available, he can use you. So God looks at him, Gideon, he says, Gideon, you mighty warrior, rise up and save your clan from the Midianites. Now I'm going to fast track the story. Then God tells him, but first, pull down the altar in your father's house to Baal. Now pulling down the father's altar to Baal meant death for Gideon. Because the people came to kill him. You read that. So Gideon obeys God's command. He pulls down the altar of Baal and he sacrifices one of the choicest bulls from this father's herd to God Almighty. Now, what I'm saying this is, in order for Gideon to fight the Midianites, he had to activate something in the spiritual so that it will empower the supernatural to act in the natural to destroy the enemy. Are you with me? So he had to pull down this altar to Baal because that was not an altar pleasing to God. It was contrary to God's plan. Unless that was pulled down, it could not move. So God, the way he moves on earth is when you and I are available to sacrificially serve him, not be touch me not Christians, but Christians who are willing to stand your, stand your ground no matter what happens. And when you are willing to cross the line and say, I am willing to die for the cause that I'm standing for, you turn on a switch in the heavens which starts working for you. So Gideon had to pull down the father's altar before he could go to battle. Now I noticed this, I was praying to God, I was saying, how many of you remember that from in 2008 it was the worst, but for about five to six years, starting from 2004, 2005 to about 2008, we had a major drought. Remember that? In that drought, many farmers committed suicide. Many farmlands were taken over by the banks. Many children left the farmlands. Many marriages broke up. My telephones were ringing like you won't believe it. Asking for prayer. Asking for prayer. Our farmers calling out for prayer. Anyone who is a farmer here? No farmers here? Yeah, praise God. Yeah. So they were desperate. They were absolutely desperate. So guess what? I was praying, I was praying, I was praying, asking God, Lord, what's the problem? Why is there no rain? Because 2 Chronicles 7, 13 says this, when I shut up the heavens and that there is no rain, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, turn away from their wicked ways and seek my face, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. It's asking the Lord, Lord, what is it which is stopping the rain from coming? Not climate. We can't, we can't pro protect the, I mean, it's, it's a big mumbo jumbo. For years and thousands of years the earth has survived and suddenly we have to collect money and save the climate. Now I think they got to call it global cooling. Yeah. I don't know if you heard of Lord Christopher Monkton. He was the advisor to Margaret Thatcher. He's been advising me on my political party campaign and he launched the party for me in Australia in 2013. He's a, what can I say, a, a authority, a top authority on climate change issues. And he said, Climate change is absolute rubbish. That they are making money and getting sovereign countries to surrender their rights into the UN General Assembly. That's a whole other area. We won't go there. But let me get back to Gideon. So God pulled down the altar to Baal. Then I'll tell you what's going to happen next. 32,000 soldiers gathered to fight. We know that. Then God says, Gideon, 32,000 is too many. Why do you think God said that? Because he wanted all the glory. He says, all those who are fear and trembling, fearful and trembling, tell them to leave. Now think of this. You have a congregation of 32,000. God tells you to tell those who are fear and trembling to leave. 22,000 get up and walk out. Two-thirds gone. 
One third of the church, two thirds of the church seats are empty. Disaster, isn't it? If that's not good enough. God says, even that's too many Gideon. Remember, this is the same Gideon who said, I can't go to battle because I'm too weak. He's seen 22,000 walk away. He says, take them down to the water. Those who lap with their hands and drink the water, separate them from the others. 9,700 fall in the water and start drinking, while 300 lap with their hands. He says, send them back too. Now the church of 32,000 has become 300 people. What do you think is supposed to be happening? Imagine the gossip possibly. Imagine the slander. Imagine what the pastor would be feeling. Imagine what they must be saying. The pastor is off his head. He's a control freak and this and that and every possible slander. But let me tell you this. If you were called to follow this pastor's vision in this church, then simply shut up and put up. You might say, no, that's controlling. No, if you're here to follow the vision, get behind the vision. If you have another vision, find a church which has that other vision. Don't try to change this church's vision to follow your vision because there'll be counter vision and then there'll be division. God can work with 300 to fulfill his plan rather than 32,000 who are not fully believing in God. Gideon wins the battle not with weapons but with a few bottles and tins and sticks. Sounds funny. I know of another man who won a battle with a five stones and a slingshot. So God works in a very different way to man's thinking. But what he's needing is a man and a woman to stand in the gap. So Gideon's army won the battle. Now this is recorded in the Bible, right? We know this story. Now why I'm saying this is, I was asking the Lord, Lord, why is the rain? And the Lord suddenly showed me something on Mount Ainsley. Mount Ainsley, I then went on to research a bit. Because I had a woman at that point who was in my church, who used to be a high priestess, who was born again. And she said, Pastor, when the moon is full, all the witches come on Mount Ainsley. They collect blood by sacrificing a goat, a rooster, and a baby in the jungle, an aborted child, possibly. They mix the blood in a bucket and they bring it and pour it on the mountain, on Mount Ainsley, on the concrete slab on top. Because why I, why I checked that out was one of my friends went and checked the place and there was much blood splattered on the concrete slab. Dry blood. And I said, what do they do? He said, she said, they curse the parliament. So why do they curse the parliament? Because members of parliament represents every single electorate, which means the whole nation is under a curse. I said, why do they do that? What do they mean? She said, they break walnut shells and they break it into pieces and they say that people of Australia will be depressed, their marriages will break up, they'll be suicidal and they'll lose the will to live. And I thought, boy, that's true. Do you know how many people are depressed? Do you know how many people are suicidal? Do you know how many marriages are breaking up? Do you know how many children are in dire straits? I travel the length and breadth of this country and my heart grows out. At night sometimes I can't sleep for three, four hours because I'm thinking and praying for Australia. Because we are in pretty bad shape, really. A nation, if it's not a healthy nation, it's in trouble. I said, Lord, why are you showing me Mount Ainsley? He said, you need to break the curse on Mount Ainsley to see the rain come back. I said, okay. So I put out an email. My title of my emails was Pulling Down the Strongholds of the Enemy on Mount Ainsley in Canberra. Calling on intercessory prayer warriors from all over the nation to come there on this particular day. The Canberra Times picked it up from my website because they checked my website. And they put up a front page article. Catch the fire comes to Canberra to pull the strongholds down. So guess what happens, the next thing. Next day I get an email from the satanic cult leader. He tells me this. You dare not come on this mountain. Because if you do come, you'll regret for coming. And if he knows me, he'll, he would have never sent me this email. Because if you tell me not to come, I'll definitely come. <laughs> so I wrote back to him and I said, Thanks mate. Nice to get to know you. See you on the mountain. He said, I am not blank, blank joking. I am blank, blank serious. 
if you do come, I'll blank, smash your face. I wrote back and I said, if you have a deed to the mountain, and you can prove that it's your line, then I can't come. But if not, as far as I'm concerned, it's a lookout. So make my day, I'll see you there. A few emails went up and down. I rocked up with 200 intercessors on this day to Mount Ainsley. When I rocked up on Mount Ainsley, there were 100 protesters waiting for us on the mountain. There were Sydney's, witches, warlocks, and the works. Many of them were witches who were dressed in black robes. They were carrying broomsticks, but they couldn't fly. <laughs> they were armed with uncle dusters, iron bars, and chains. All of them were under 30 or 25 years of age. I had 200 intercessors from across the country. We were also armed with shofars, tambourines, and flags. <laughs> and my mob was mostly over 60. <laughs> so I get off the car. As I get off the car, one guy comes darting towards me. He walked like this. When I saw him coming towards me, I also walked just like him. And I walked right up to him. He had two men by his side. I had two of my guys with me praying. We came nose to nose. Then he said this. I thought I told you not to come on this mountain. I knew this was the cult leader. I responded. I thought I told you that I was coming on the mountain. <laughs> then the guy looked at my eyes and he said to me, I hate you. I said, I love you. <laughs> then I noticed his hand doing this. So corner of my eye looked down and his head a knuckle duster. Now, of course, I've done karate before. So I was ready to, not to give my other cheek, but to give him a good punch. If, sometimes you have to give a punch, you know. It's called a five-finger blessing. Yeah. It's a five-fold blessing you give them. No, I'm joking. Okay. Then I said, by the way, my name is Daniel. What's your name? You should have seen the guy's face change. His whole face started trembling like this. His eyeballs turned red, short red. And he spoke with a completely different voice. And if you have heard people demon possessed speaking, he said this something like this. I am Lucifer. Now, I truly believe the spirit of Lucifer was manifesting through him to, to intimidate me, thinking that if Lucifer shows herself up or shows himself up, then I'll get back off. I said, ah, oh, I've been waiting to meet you for a long time. <laughs> the guy shook his head and he turned and walked away. Now what they did was they, they cordoned off the mountain top where the blood was. They looped their hands together. And they put six dogs, Alsatian bulldog rock whalers, on the steps, 28 steps to go up to the mountain top. My team was on the car park. One, there were some gay guys also there. One of the gay guys uh, started taking his clothes off. So one of the intercessors come and whispered to me, Pastor, that boy is taking his clothes off. I thought to myself, what can I do? <laughs> I just told the sister, don't worry, it's very cold. <laughs> I'll tell you, we were not laughing that day. It was pretty intense. It was really a standoff. It was like Ahab and Elijah on the mountain. I said, we are going up the mountain at the right time when God tells us. They were not sure what I was going to do because the church in Australia has never front faced confrontation such directly and forcefully against the enemy, the devil. My heart went out for these young kids. 
I thought to myself, very often church has outreach, but there's a hardly unrich people. I thought, what a great outreach here. We have 100 unrich people. Possibly most of them have never had the love of their father. So I told my team, don't get angry with these kids. Be bold, be strong, but love them. Who knows what God is going to do here? Suddenly I had this flash of anointing come upon me and I said, we are marching up the mountain. We're going on the concrete slab. We are taking the high places for Jesus. As I said that, I looked at the reaction on the mountain top. I took the megaphone. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in. Oh, Lord, I want to be in that number. Oh, when the saints go marching in. I started singing it and started marching up the steps. You should have seen my intercessors were not sure what to do, but they thought they'll follow me. <laughs> Chauffeurs blowing, guitars playing, tambourines ringing, flags waving. We were coming right up the steps. I saw the dogs going like this. <laughs> you, uh, the DVD has most of what I'm saying. My cameraman actually filmed the whole thing. If you run out of those DVDs, call the office and get them. Now, I prayed this simple prayer. I said, God, if you could have shut the mouth of the lions for the Daniel of old, shut them for me. Shut the dog's mouth for me. As I finished praying, as if the lightning struck the dogs, and the dogs started pulling the owners and running down the slopes of the mountain. I came right up to the chains of hands locked in. As I walked up to them, they took their hands off and just let us walk right through them. We went up the concrete slab. We wept and wept and cried for Australia. Just such repentance fell upon our hearts for the nation. We poured oil all over the slab. We cancelled the curses. And we prayed for blessing over the nation. As we do, finished doing that, we took communion right in front of them. We took communion on the mountain. When we finished taking communion, a cloud appeared. Just a small cloud. And it rained where we were. And we had not seen rain for months and months and months at that time. As that finished, these kids started asking us this one question. You'll see it on the DVD. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you really love me? Four months later, the satanic cult leader gave his life to Jesus. I went to his house in Canberra. And he was making me a coffee in the kitchen. I was in the lounge room. And he shouted out from the kitchen. He said, hey, you, pastor. I can't understand why I love you. But because I used to hate you. I said, in fact, Steve, I was wondering, what happened? He came out and he said, you know what? You guys showed guts and love. We never expected you to come. He said, you know, when I met you, I was about to crack you with this knuckle duster. I couldn't lift my hand. My friends brought iron bars and chains to attack your people. We couldn't lift our hands. He said, some of my friends took rocks to throw on you. But they couldn't throw the rocks. That's the first time we realized your God is more powerful than the devil. Come on. Why don't we give Jesus a shout? Hallelujah! This is real, people. This is real stuff. Well, then I asked the Lord, Lord, what else can I do? What else must I do for the rain? I normally get up at four in the morning and spend two hours speaking the Lord. And when I was praying, the Lord said, call Prime Minister John Howard's office and tell his secretary that you are available to meet with him next week. So I come to the office and I tell my secretary, I say, Kirsten, call the Prime Minister's office and tell his secretary that I'm available to meet him next week. <laughs> my secretary looked at me as if I've fallen off a banana truck. <laughs> she was like, are you serious? I said, yes. Well, guess what? 
He got a call back 24 hours later. And John Howard gave me a time to meet him. Now I said, God, why am I going to meet with John Howard? What am I going to tell him? Every day I went to prayer, nothing happened. The day before I left, he gave me a word for the Prime Minister. And I said, Lord, can't you give me something nice? How am I going to tell him this? And I rock up in his office. He's full of praise for me because I won the court case. He, in fact, put his arms around my shoulder. And he was going on and on and on about the case. And then he said about how we have set a precedence for any case in the future that there will be a defense in the country. Do you know that there are 83 court cases around the world right now for litigation and my case has been used as their defense? Yeah. So when Mr. Howard finished, I said, Prime Minister, Sir, Mr. Prime Minister, so may I share what I've come to share with you? And I'm thinking, how am I going to tell this man when he has said such nice things about me? I said, Sir, the reason for the drought, God told me to tell you, you had done many wrong things. You need to ask God forgiveness on behalf of the nation and yourself and the government. As I said that, there was an uneasy feeling of silence in the place. I thought Prime Minister is going to tell me to leave. He thought for a moment and he said, Pastor, what must I do? I said, would you pray with me? He said, no. You press pray for me and then I will pray for myself. I can't remember what I prayed, but I can remember what the Prime Minister prayed after me. He had, we were seated on two chairs, two little couches. There was a coffee table in the middle. His elbows were on his knees and his hands were like that. This was his prayer word to word. Dear Lord, I'm a fallible human being. I've made many mistakes. Please forgive me. At that moment, the word of the Lord came there to me and said this. Today, the prophet and the king have come in agreement. You get what I'm saying? My healing is coming on the nation. The next week, we got the parliamentary great hall. 700 Christians wept in that building for four hours, asking the drought to be broken. That afternoon, there was no forecast of rain at all. But that was the beginning that afternoon. The rain started pouring. And literally, it's rained somewhere in Australia from that day up to today, every day. Now, Glenda, who is sitting at the back there, she's a friend of mine. I'm going to ask Glenda a question, and I want you to loud, answer loud, okay? Now, I've, she does not know that I'm going to ask her this question. Glenda, what happens generally when I go to a town? Okay. Nine out of ten places where God takes me to, it rains. Rain is a sign of blessing. Never say bad weather when it's raining. You're blessed. The rain is the natural before the supernatural rain of the Holy Spirit. I am very excited because I can see the thunder in the distance. I can feel the rumbling of the rail trains. I know the presence of God is about to sweep Australia very soon. I can feel it all over me. But are we willing to break down the altars in our personal life, in our homes, in our families? And then if you want to take a nation, there are altars we need to break in the nation to see God glorified. I'm going to close with this one more testimony. I generally have three closings. Okay. Some months ago, I was traveling to speak at the RSL in New South Wales, in Sydney, in Blacktown. I got a call from the Sydney Morning Herald, and the journalist told me, can I do a story about you coming here? I said, sure. Then I asked her, why are you so interested in doing a story? She said, because one of my journalists went to Auburn in New South Wales, which is second to Lakemba. And he was kicked out of the place because he was white by the Muslims living there. So I'm absolutely ticked off. And since your political party stands to keep Australia Australian, I thought I'd promote your party. She wrote a fantastic article 
It's nice at times to get a good article. Then I'm driving with my mate who's driving me to the airport. My telephone rings, it's Channel 7. Channel 7 reporter says, I'm calling you from today tonight, Channel 7. Are you on your way to Sydney? I said, yes. We want to do an interview with you. I said, sure. Uh, about your trip to Sydney to speak at the RSL. I said, sure. Then the guy said me, asked me, who is picking you up? I said, one of my friends is picking me up in Sydney at the airport. He said, no, Channel 7 will pick you up at the airport. So I was really thrilled. Channel 7 picking me up at the airport, eh? <laughs> so the four-wheel drive, Channel 7 four-wheel drive comes. Minister Scott Morrison gets off on another plane. Scott Morrison goes to the car park to get his car while Channel 7 picks me up. So I looked at Scott Morrison and I said, once in a way we have a better time also, you know. Anyway, no, I'm just joking. Um, so we got into this Channel 7 vehicle. The driver, cameraman, the reporter, and myself. So I thought we were going to the Channel 7 studio. And the reporter said to me, we're going to the suburb called Auburn to do the interview with you. Then he says to me, Daniel, the last time I did an interview in Auburn, the guy I took got punched by the Muslims. That was three months ago. In case something happens when we go there, we have hired two bodyguards for you. Oh yeah, okay. That's very encouraging, you know. <laughs> we arrive in Auburn in a car park to find a second camera crew. And then I'm looking at the bodyguards. Two big fellows. And Channel 7 reporter says, these are your two bodyguards, Daniel, meet Ahmad and Mohammed. Now, this is the mindset. Channel 7 called a security company and asked for two people to be sent. They didn't ask who they were going to send. So they sent Ahmad and Muhammad. Now, Ahmad and Muhammad are not going to protect me. Because they'll take the side of the Muslims. Now we are walking on the streets of Auburn. I was shocked. I'd never been there before. I thought I was in Dubai. Men with their full white top. It was Friday, lunchtime, prayer time smoking their pipes, women fully covered in black. All the shops were in Arabic, letters. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what's happening to Australia? Anyway, we stop in front of the mosque, which recruits people to go and fight against Azad, now known as ISIS. 100 Muslim young people are praying in the mosque. And I was still not sure what we were going to do there. When the mosque prayer time finished, they were coming out when the journalist looked at them and said, Excuse me, this is Pastor Daniel. His political party, Rise Up Australia Party, is going to keep Australia Australian. And they will not put up with multiculturalism. What do you have to say? <laughs> now the guys didn't fully understand, so they first started off very nicely. They asked me the question and I explained to them, I said, listen, I want to tell you this. I love you. I love everyone. But if you... Now, I could have spoken this way. I said, because I chose to come to Australia, it's my duty to integrate into Australian way of life. And I'm sure that's the way with you too, right? Because we have chosen to come. We've got to become a part of the country. We can't change this country to where you come from. Allah Akbar! Allah Akbar! No changing! No changing, mate! This country of Islam! Allah give this country for us to come and occupy. This guy is saying this. Muslims are telling this. Oh, it gets a bit heated. Then I said, no. This country is Christian. Built on Judeo-Christian values, on the Ten Commandments and the Bible. So you're welcome to come, but you will never turn this country to be an Islamic country because we will stand up and fight. Now the argument gets very heated. One against 100. Look for Ahmad and Muhammad. Both are missing. <laughs> They were on the other side. <laughs> but God in his supernatural glory. I heard a noise behind me. I turned back. Fifteen police officers were behind me. Someone called the cops. Four to five police vehicles. They were fully armed with capsicum spray and the works. 
standing right behind me. Then the reporter says, another policy of this party is to make sure that legislation is passed so that Sharia law will never be established in Australia. What do you have to say? Oh my goodness, they got really mad. What are you talking, they asked me. I said, I am telling you, Sharia law has no place in Australia. I lived in Saudi Arabia and I will not let Australia become Saudi Arabia. I said, we have common law, the Magna Carta, built on the Ten Commandments, and that's how this country is going to be. You will never get Sharia law. I don't know what boldness came upon me to just an anointing of the Lord. I was speaking to the 100 as he was speaking to two people, and like I had 100 people, like, you know, God was on my side. Elisha said this to his servant, there are more on our side than on the other side. Then the reporter said, they also have a policy to put a monitorium on Muslim immigration to stop immigration for 10 years of Muslims coming into the country. All hell broke loose just then. <laughs> they were shouting Allahu Akbar and screaming and I had to stand my ground and tell them, until you guys get your act right, we can't have many more of you coming into this country. Unless you're willing to stand up and fight for your own rights. I said, many Muslims love what I'm doing because I'm fighting for their rights too. Many Muslims left their country because they wanted a better life in Australia. You're making it bad for them too. Because every Muslim is not a bad Muslim. Every Muslim. There are many, many good Muslim people. So I want to stand up and say, I'm standing with those Muslims to fight to protect Australia. The amazing thing is, not one punch was thrown. Not one person attacked me. We finished the interview and I walked out of the place untouched. Now, why I'm sharing this is, I went to my hotel room, fell by my bed and I asked, God, what was all of that? Very unexpected. Why did it happen? And I heard these words from the Lord very clearly. My son, for that what has to be done in heaven, I need someone on earth to declare it. Haven't I said in my word that what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, that what you lose on earth and used in heaven? He said, you have gone as my ambassador right into the face of the enemy and declared in their face there will be no Sharia law in Australia. And he said, so shall it be. Let's give the Lord a clap for him. He said, what you're going to see or what's happened in years to come, you'll realize. Because now it's established in heaven. You have prophetically declared my prophet's voice into the nation. Right in the face of Islam, in the most dangerous place, you declared you will never get Sharia law in Australia. Now, I also heard this word say, because I could not just send you alone, I organized Channel 7 to go with you. And I gave you 15 police officers and Ahmad and Muhammad. <laughs> so I believe that was another major altar which we pulled down that day. Now I'm ready to take the nation back for Jesus. I can go on telling you of the many altars God has called me to pull down. But he's not just called one man. He's called all of you to pull down those altars too. What would you do to protect Australia? To keep Australia Australian for generations to come? God bless you. Love you very much. Please uphold us in prayer.